confined to just half time. By scoring 49 points, the offense was just dazzling. And by giving up only three, the D was just as cool. So get ready, Vol fans. Here it comes. Tennessee versus Colorado State. Next on Big Orange Sunday. The UTV Network presents Big Orange Sunday with your hosts, Greg Peterson, Daryl Patterson, Steve Phillips, special guests and features, and John Ward, volunteer journalist. Brought to you by Budweiser, Beachwood Age for that clean, crisp taste. This Bud's for you. By the big orange Ford dealers of Tennessee, where you can get 1.9% financing for new cars and trucks. By St. Mary's Medical Center in Knoxville, caring for you anytime with total health care. By the natural gas utilities and pipeline companies throughout Tennessee. And by First American Bank, where banking is still a people business. Everybody and welcome to Big Horn Sunday. I'm Greg Peterson along with Daryl Patterson from WTBC in Chattanooga and Charles Davis, a former ball defensive back. We each week we'll be bringing you a full hour of Tennessee football, new concepts in college football coverage. We'll be bringing you analysis as well as Southeastern Conference highlights from around the conference from the previous day's action. And first off, let's go right now to the first quarter of action in Tennessee versus Colorado State from yesterday. Well, it was an exciting opener for Tennessee at home. A great crowd here, 92,000 plus here. Charles had had to kind of bring back old memories for you to see the Orange go out there on the field, huh? Oh, well, it was great to see the team come flying out into the field, fired up, ready to play football like they wanted to. It was a great opener, like you said, with the new press boxes and everything else. And it's wonderful to have football going on again here in Tennessee. Well, let me tell you, the fans were ready last night for the opening kickoff. And last night's game started with a bang, really. It will be Tennessee kicking off. And uh, for the... Colorado State Rams are going to be, of course, uh, probably back there will be Carr and Beach. Dick, uh, Dirk Borgannoni is going to be the kickoff man, and it will be Carr and Beach deep as Borgannoni hits it and hits it high and long and down to take the ball two yards deep in the end zone. He'll hold it out to the goal line, to the five, to the ten. Humbles that football. There's a scramble for it, and I think we'll just wait and see. Tennessee might have come out of there with a loose fumble as it was Carr who returned the ball. He was hit and hit hard at the 10-yard line. That was a great break for us, uh, and we caused the break. I don't know who made the tackle right yet. I haven't had a chance to find out, Greg, but it was a great tackle on the kickoff, and Borgen on his kicking made a big difference in our game overall, too, because of the great field position he established by the way he kicked off for us. Three plays later, Tennessee had the ball, first and 10 on the one-yard line. High backfield to the line. And the failback hurtling forward. It is touchdown, Tennessee. William Howard scores for the Volunteers. Scoring behind the one of Charles Wilson on the left side and Harry Galbraith. And with only two minutes and 29 seconds gone in this football game, actually one minute and 29 seconds, Tennessee is on top 6 nothing. After two changes of possession, the Rams had the ball, second and seven, at their own 23. Man in motion again, right to left. Back to throw will be Molander being pursued. Molander in trouble. Sack at the 10-yard line by Tracy Hampton. Tracy Hayworth. Tracy Hayworth is the man who gets there and throws him down. And Tracy Hayworth from Decker, the sophomore, at 6'2", 232, showed great speed and quickness, Bill. And Molander is sacked back at the 10-yard line. Yeah, he came through there. He Molander took it off kind of a rollout or a bootleg type play coming back to the short side of the field. And when he looked up, even Hayworth was right in his face. He had no chance. Minus 12 as Hayworth gets credit for the sack. And it will be third down 20 for the Rams. Molander again to throw. Waiting, looking. Pass across the middle. Intercepted Tennessee. Ball down at the 20-yard line by Kelly Ziegler. Ziegler back down to the 15. Ziegler carries the ball to the 11-yard line. And Tennessee will have it first down, 10 to go at the 11. Kelly Ziegler, 6'1", 220 senior. 
Miami, Florida, moved in perfect position to make the pick off the pass by Melander. Well, uh, we had a little joke, you know, when Kelly intercepted that pass, I said, Kelly, did you get a good break on the ball? Or, you know, he fell right into it. And Kelly told me, he said, you know, if I didn't have these gloves on, I don't think I would have caught the ball. <laughs> you know, the gloves helped out the ball. I just kind of put my hands up and the ball kind of stuck. I was like, whoa, I got the ball. Uh, you know, but I was in the right place at the right time and, and, and came down with the ball. So. On the next play, the balls cash in on the second turnover of the game. Francis to throw, screen set up, pull down at the 10, to the 15, to the 10, to the 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, give him six. Reggie Cobb scores for the Volunteers. It's Cobb on the screen left as the Tennessee offensive line left about three or four Rams sit through, Ooh. and Cobb got it, cut back, slicing on the cutback. Driving to score. Well, that was a quick screen. They just let, them, let the people come through on the left side. He popped it over their head out there to Cobbs. And boy, he got a couple of great blocks. I couldn't see who it was. They gave him a couple of great blocks downfield. I feel real good. Uh, I feel it was, uh, the line did a good job blocking and the quick screen was there. And uh, I just ran it in. Did it feel like you hoped it would feel, like you thought it might feel to score your first touchdown at Neyland? Yeah, it did. I, I kind of felt it deep inside. So it felt real good. It was a good feeling. And, of course, uh, Darrell, coming out of the Iowa game, Coach Johnny Major said specialty teams and defense was something they really needed to work on. Iowa really capitalized on a lot of their mistakes, and although Tennessee did inch away with a one-point win, they needed to work on that. Apparently, they got the job done. It was very apparent against Colorado State. And a little bit surprisingly, too, because it was a short week. I mean, to play Iowa last Sunday, and then this week they get the special teams of the defense really going. I wanted to ask Charles about the gloves that Kelly Ziegler was talking about. What does he mean by the, by the gloves and in helping him catch the ball better on that interception? I'm not really sure what he means by, <laughs> by how the gloves. I thought all, all you defensive guys did that. I think a lot of the reason is that gloves feel better on a lot of guys' hands, and Kelly's in a lot of action. He's banging a lot of people. and just feels a lot better, a lot more secure feeling for him to have gloves on his hands to be able to play. I think a lot of guys wear them just because they like the way it looks with the uniform. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly also said that he had a chat with Darren Miller after that, and uh, Darren said he would have scored if he would have made that interception. <laughs> but Kelly also said he would have run that 96 yards last week against Iowa a lot faster. <laughs> oh, I can understand that. <laughs> Let me ask you a little bit about the defense now. That was that was a, a, a key question going into the season, how it would respond and how it would come up to the challenge after a disappointing season like last year. The first two games have looked mighty darn good. It looked very, very good. I think a lot of it is that Coach May just put a lot of emphasis on it in spring practice. After last season, we had a lot of disappointments last year on defense. Didn't play as well as we wanted to, but he put a lot of emphasis in it in the spring, and he said that they needed to get better. They needed to re improve and respond, and the team has done that. They've come out fired up, ready to play football. They play very sound football. And people like Kelly Ziegler and Darren Miller, seniors, people like that leading the way, I think they're going to continue to play that way the rest of the year. And another key, although Phil Rich did kick that winning field goal last week, his kickoffs were less than par, and Dirk Barganoni came in this week and did a fantastic job booming him into the end zone just about every kick. It's easy to see why I kicked a 68-yarder in high school when you yeah. see that leg he <laughs> exhibited last night. And the second quarter was almost as exciting as the first. We'll have those highlights in just one moment. ball game the Tennessee Volunteers led 14 to nothing of course the quick touchdown after a very early turnover and then the offense kind of sputtering and that's a, maybe a little bit of reason for concern early on the offense didn't live up into the end of the bargain maybe as well as the defense did. I think that's just a lot of anticipation and preseason from a lot of people we went to the season everyone thought about the defense needed work the defense needed to improve and the offense would take care of itself and now people find out that maybe Offense isn't as fine-tuned as they thought it would be, and I think that's just a little problem to go iron not going into Mississippi State. I don't think it's really any major concern right now. And, you know, that was another thing Coach Major said he really wanted to get into this ball game to get an early lead and let some of the uh, reserves play as well. Randy Sanders got it in the first quarter, and that was really good, and I think that may have been some of the reason of the sputtering. But anyway, in the second quarter, the balls continue to capitalize on the Colorado State miscues. Here are the highlights from the second. will be Alan Glazier to punt, and deep for Tennessee goes Kramer. The Vols line up with eight men on the line as Glazier gets the snap, fumbles the ball, and is blasted down, and it will be Tennessee recovering, actually not recovering, but actually downing the ball at the 12-yard line. Cedric Klein is the man who overpowers Glazier. On his previous punt, this youngster 
had fired for minus three. That's right, minus three on a punt. And on this one, he juggles the snap, drops it to the turf, scampers to pick it up, and as he does, he is hit and dropped by Klein. And so again, a turnover, although not really a turnover, a mistake by the Rams gives Tennessee excellent field position. Well, with the turnovers we had and the, the drives that Tennessee started, you know, uh, on the 10-yard line and around, around there for the first three scores, that was uh, that was a tough position for a defense team to be in. And uh, I think that's a classic example of why it's so important, why coaches worry about it all the time. You know, you can't fumble and you can't throw interceptions, you can't turn the ball over, and uh, we did all of it. And we had terrible uh, problems with the kicking game, from the snap to the catches to the punts and it was uh, just a tough night all the way around. I don't know that I've ever seen that many mistakes by one team, you know, in, in one in a game. Usually uh, the other team will make a few, but we made all of them tonight. And yet another Ram mistake led to another Vol score as Jeff Francis takes over after a holding penalty on the 21. Tennessee with three wide outs into the football game. Two right, one left into the boundary. Wing back to the left side as well. Single running back, and Francis again is checking off at the line of scrimmage. Against now a five-man front. Francis takes the drop, gets the pressure, steps to the left, runs with the football. 20 down to the 15, stutter stepping to the 12-yard line. Good effort that time by Jeff Francis, moving to the left side, cutting back then inside a would-be tackle by Rule, and he slithers forward until Doug Wills knocks him down as Wills from Morris in Colorado at 6'5", 244, makes the stop. Bill, Tennessee just not in sync. Not at all, John. Uh, of course, Francis taking a long time to get the ball in play and get the play called. That time, he did a good job of picking up a few yards, but uh, really, uh, nobody opened downfield, nowhere to throw it. So Francis will have it second down. Pitch will go to the tailback. Cobb at the right side. Ten. Down to the five. Down to the four. Down to the three. He is tackled at the two-yard line as Reggie Cobb got a big block from Southern Oxfordian John Bruin on the right side. He moves right outside that block, and Bill, once he gets to that point of attack, he accelerates. Well, that's the way you tailback to be a good one. You've got to be able to make that cut, and he can make that quick cut and turn it straight up the field. So Chelsea will have it very close to a first down, but it, I do not believe it will be a first down. It's going to be third down, about a half yard to go for the first, about two yards to go for the touchdown. So Tennessee lines it up. Power I, Howard the standing tailback. Wing back right. Oh, Tennessee jumps, I think. Handoff goes to the wing back, carrying the ball, Charles Wilson. He's at the three, at the two, at the one. Is there a flag? There is no flag. Give him six. Touchdown, Charles Wilson. Out of reverse. Off the power I set right, he, the wing back, cuts back to the left. And I guess the motion I saw, Bill, was Wilson took a quick step, but he took the step laterally, and so, in fact, he became a man in motion. That field position haunted Colorado State the whole game. But later in the third quarter, the Rams did get the ball on their 32. It resulted in Colorado State's only score. The field goal try is in the air. Oh, he hits it well. It is end over inning its way, and it is good! So State is on the scoreboard with a field goal, and it was made by Tyler. So it was Tennessee 21 and Colorado State 3 after the first half, and I tell you what, Tennessee really took advantage of those miscues by that poor freshman punter for the Rams, Brian Glazer, the largest crowd he ever played in front of in high school, 300 people. His first time ever in college, he plays in front of 95,000 folks. you got to feel sorry for the guy. Uh, you really do. I mean, the kid is, a, number one, he's a freshman, as, as a lot of Coach Fuller's players were last night and he plays like you said in front of 95,000 that's a whole lot different than 300 that he played in front of in high school and they had to bother him a little bit oh most definitely when you come out of high school I came out of a small high school also and the biggest crowd I ever played in front of 1500 and to come out and play in front of 95,000 people for anyone it's a different experience and for especially when you're the visiting team now of course uh, the Tennessee scoring Three different backs got a chance to go over the goal line. That's got to give them a little confidence. Do you think Majors is doing that intentionally uh, when you got two or three yards to go, give each back a chance to go over the goal line, maybe to help not uh, have any animosity among the running backs? Well, I don't know if he's worried too much about animosity. I think that he teaches a team concept here, and everyone knows that if they do everything right, they do it for the good of the team. That's the best thing they can do. But it also does help. It builds depth. It builds a lot of... Uh, character for the team and people who get in and get the, get the score, they feel they can contribute a lot more during the rest of the season. What really was a key last night was the defense and the special teams giving the ball offense 
excellent field position. Coach Fuller mentioned a while ago that his team was backed up. They never started a drive past the, their own 36-yard line or anything like that, 32-yard line. And the rest of the time, it was like the 15, the 20, and the 25. That had to have a, a big effect on Colorado State in starting a deep field position, whereas Tennessee started an excellent field position, and as we said, capitalized. A lot of changes here in Knoxville. Well, not a lot, but a few changes here at the Press Box and a great halftime show. Plus, second half highlights coming up. The word about the economic impact of the beef industry in Tennessee. We think Orange Sunday, everybody. You know, last night was an exciting time, not only to the opening, home opener for the Tennessee Volunteers, but also the opening of a new press box, a big fireworks display. A great time by all. Big Orange Sunday's Karen Hood takes a look at the activity. Ball fans started gathering around the UT campus shortly after 4 p.m. to begin celebrating their return to the Orange Country. The typical tailgate tradition was visible in virtually every parking lot around the stadium. And every fan had their own idea of the perfect way to spend their time before the game. To have a good time with UT football is just to be a good fan and have a good party, especially on the tailgate. Six loaves of bread, uh, some uh, um, tangy cheese bread, and I think that's it. Well, the first thing you got to do is get mom in a good humor so you can get away, see. I just love to be with all my sisters and my friends and Got here to see Big Orange go. <laughs> well, we say good afternoon to the campus of the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. As the kickoff coming show, the stage is set. The, the Vol Network was celebrating, too. Play-by-play -play announcer John Ward and color man Bill Anderson marked their 20th anniversary covering Tennessee football by broadcasting on location at McClung Plaza. I've been listening to John Ward ever since I was about 10 years old. And I've always wanted to come up here and work for him, and I'm finally here, and I just can't believe I am, really. If you told me five years ago I'd be working for John Ward, I wouldn't have believed you. After the last piece of chicken has been eaten and the last Tupperware container has been sealed, it's time for every good ball fan to head through the gates to see what their favorite team has in store for them. Neyland Stadium has gone through a great deal of change in its 66-year history, and its newest addition is the fabulous four-story press box with spacious surroundings, making a more workable environment for the press. There is plenty of room for the print media as well as TV and radio. Television monitors tell the story from every angle, and members of the media say the changes are welcome. Last year it was just smaller. There were too many people in here for the, the confines. I think it was a little archaic. Now it's just really up to par, and I think it's the best in the country. We really improved ourselves with radio and television broadcast with photographer space. And it's really an overall improvement. The real action, however, is on the field and in the stands, where a touchdown sparks dreams of how these fans will spend New Year's Day. Could it be, perhaps, somewhere in New Orleans? We're going to go to the Sugar Bowl, have a big time for two weeks this time. We're not all three days. We're going to go down there for two weeks. They're going to do great this year. Ball's going to go all the way. They're going to be in the Sugar Bowl and win the National Championship. How about that? And as usual, the pride of the Southland band gave an outstanding performance winding it up with a bang as fireworks illuminated the skies over Neyland Stadium. Tennessee fans continue to dream, but only time will tell if dreams really do come true in Big Orange country. For Big Orange Sunday, I'm Karen Hood. The fireworks on the field last night as well as in the sky, and as sports broadcasters ourselves, we were lucky enough to be able to spend the night at the new press box, and it is one fabulous facility. I've traveled all, <laughs> not all over the country, but to a lot of places in the cover, uh, country covering a lot of football games. There is no press box nicer and more functional than this new press box is in Tennessee, especially up at the upper level where we didn't get to go last night. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people would uh, say the giant city in the Meadowlands where we were last week is one of the finest facilities in the country. Tennessee's got them licked, I have to admit. Oh, yeah, for working facilities for the press and for the skyboxes for the fans, couldn't be in a better place at Big Orange Country, huh? Tennessee continues to roll in the third quarter. We'll have those highlights coming up next. Tennessee against Colorado State in the third quarter, and uh, of course the defense helping Tennessee score some points in that first half, but in the second half now, the Tennessee offense finally gets on track and has a couple of sustained drives that finally looks impressive. Yeah, you have to imagine that Coach Majors and the staff told the 
players at halftime, just go out in the second half and do what you did in the first half. We liked it a lot, and that's about what happened. Yeah, that is what happened. And of course, that's probably what he did tell the team, is go out, loosen up, have some fun, enjoy yourselves while you're out. This is the type of game you should have a lot of fun because it's going to be a lot of tough games down the road. Again, a couple of keys. Borgannoni's kickoff after the touchdown. Again, booming into the end zone, not giving the Rams any chance for a run back. Also, Reggie Cobb, again, comes through with some tremendous running uh, in one of those sustained drives, a big part of that drive. Yeah. And like we said, the third quarter, almost a repeat of the first two quarter. Let's pick up the highlights. Now Tennessee sets as Francis again is checking off at the line. Francis to throw. Pass is caught. Yanked down here by Thomas Wood, who's got a first down. He makes the grab at the 25-yard line. He was man-on-man -man against Tassone. Tried to elude him, could not do so. And then Tassone got help from Cortell, the free safety. But Tennessee has it first down and 10 to go at the 21-yard line. Tennessee still, Bill, very deliberate in getting the plays off. They are. That was an audible there again. I think, of course, they, as they set up, he had man-on-man, -man, single coverage over here. He audible to him, hit him, as, depending on trying to give him a chance to run with it. Tennessee with the ball, Francis. Pitch will go to Cobb in the corner. He's got one well, to the 20. He's got to the outside 15. He's at the 10. Five. Put it down at the four-yard line by Ron Cortell. Big, big block by freshman Roland Cole at the corner, and then... Cobb just explodes downfield, and Tennessee, after the 16-yard pickup, will have it first down and goal to go. That's what they need to do, John. They're much stronger than State. They just take the ball, give it to somebody, and turn it up the field, and they can move the football. They've been going with the dipsy doodle way too far too much. Tennessee now back to a to the line of scrimmage with the more familiar power I set right. Hand off tailback, dancing, diving, spinning, twirling, driving, goal! Touchdown, Reggie Cobb. Eric Still and Big Roland Pole cleared the pass. And it was the driving Cobb who scores the touchdown. And Tennessee drives downfield to build the advantage to 27-3. I feel more confident. And the offensive line is doing such a good job. As long as they keep on, I feel I run to do it. I, I learn a little bit every week. I think that's what's making me more comfortable. I see how it is in a game type situation where it's a little faster or things don't really happen like the drawn up as in practice and stuff. So I'm learning more and more every week. Cobb's touchdown run capped the ball's only sustained drive of the game. On the next CSU possession, the ball D came up with Volander. another big play. Volander sees it break down, fumbles that football, scrambling for it at the 28 yard line. It has been recovered by Tennessee. Charles McRae applies the hit. And Kelly Ziegler recovers the fumble. Uh, this week we worked a lot on uh, trying to make the big breaks and uh, get big plays. And uh, we came to this ball game thinking we can make the big plays and uh, keep them from getting their momentum up so we have a good chance to win. So that's what we tried to do. Four plays after the turnover, the balls were looking at second and 16 Four possible at the receivers. 20. Francis, handoff, bump, then with the football to the left side. Cobb, Cobb to the 20, Cobb to the 15. Cobb moves the ball down to the... 11-yard line. That was Howard, not Cobb. As Howard had been inserted at tailback that time, and it was he who took the delay or draw give, and he comes uh, slicing off the right side of the line and moves it back down to the 11-yard line. It will be third down and right at six yards to go. Francis, keeper, left side five, cuts back four, three, two, one, give him six. Francis, touchdown, big on it. It's Jeff Francis running the option to the left side. He sees a big swath open up, and he cuts back. Was hit at the three, but determinedly dug it out into the end zone to score, and Tennessee builds its lead over State to 34-3. to It's just good to get in the end zone. Uh, I had my first one here, first one rushing, so, you know, that felt good to get in. I've taken a lot, of, a lot of abuse from, say, our coaches about running the option, not being able to run it well, and uh, it was really exciting for me to be able to execute in the game. Jeff's first rushing touchdown as a Tennessee volunteer. Usually he's very reserved on the uh, football field. He doesn't show much emotion, but he got over the goal line and he was going nuts over there. I tell you what, I asked him uh, in the locker room whether that was one of the most exciting things that has happened to him. He said, yeah, most definitely, especially he's calmed down some of the coaches now. He proved he can run the option. Yeah, he's a passing quarterback. What's he doing running the <laughs> option play? Huh? I'm not sure, but the arm that he's got, I'm not sure a lot of people would want him running the option too much, but I'm very happy for Jeff. And he showed a few moves and a little power to get over the end zone. Yeah, he really did. Of course, Reggie Cobb rushing for uh, 
72 yards on 12 carries. Again, a tremendous, tremendous effort by Reggie Cobb. He's got a lot of Tennessee Big Orange fans infatuated. They were yelling, Reggie, Reggie, by the time he left the game. And you know what they like most about him? He's a redshirt freshman. That's what they like most about him, <laughs> that there's more to come That's from right. Reggie Cobb. What an excellent game. Cobb and company continued in the fourth quarter, although they did give way to some lesser-known players. The reserves, as we said, got into the game early last night, and then in the fourth quarter is when the reserves really took over, but, hey, they kept on scoring, too. Fourth quarter highlight in just a moment. To say that Tennessee dominated last night's game against Colorado State would be an understatement. It was a very comfortable lead going into the fourth quarter. And as we've mentioned a couple of times already, Coach Major's got the opportunity to get a lot of younger players into the ball game very early. And those younger players were wanting their time in the <laughs> limelight too, huh? And I think we all know who we're talking about. Sterling Hatton, the young redshirt freshman quarterback getting in, in back of Randy Sanders, in back of Jeff Francis. And the first time he throws up a ball, a 45-yard touchdown strike to another redshirt freshman, Alvin Harper. A great thrill for both those young players. Oh, definitely. Late in ball games, late in blowouts, a lot of people like to call that garbage time. But like you said, <laughs> for the younger players, it's not garbage time. It's show time for them. It's time for them to produce their wares. And Sterling Hinton, Alvin Harper, and a lot of other young people got to go out and display their wares last night. They did a great job doing it. Now, unfortunately, uh, Charles, you weren't able to get some of that valuable playing time before you stepped in as a starter. You came in as a redshirt freshman, and you stepped on the football field as a starter in the defensive backfield against Pitt. Would you have rather had some of that uh, garbage time, what you thought? No, I don't think so. I think it was exciting for all of us to step out there together because I wasn't alone. Terry Brown was also a redshirt freshman at that time in the secondary, and Tommy Sims and Joe Cooper were just sophomores. So we loved, we loved going out there together, knowing that we were all in it with each other. And Yes, garbage time would have helped, but... At the same time, it all worked out well in the end, and I think it's going to work out well for everyone else on the team. So Tennessee leading 35-3 to going into the fourth quarter, and Sterling Hedden's touchdown pass coming up. Oh, yeah. A Tony Nelson interception set up a Phil Rich field goal to make the score 38-3. After that, many Tennessee reserves played and gave volunteer fans a glimpse of the future. Hinton, delay, play action, fake, back to throw. Hinton, long pass into the end zone. The man is there. Give him six. Touchdown, Tennessee. Alvin Harper. Sterling Hinton comes into the game. And two plays later is on target with fellow freshman Alvin Harper at 6'5", catching the ball over Adolf Renault. And Tennessee leads by a score of 44 to 3. Bill, that was a beautiful throw. He had Harper on the fly right up the sideline. He laid it in there right in stride. Any other place, he probably wouldn't have been able to make the catch. Beautiful throw. I had a choice to which side I wanted to go to or take a dump. I figured, well, the dumps were, they didn't look too hot. So I figured if I'm going to take a chance, I want to take a chance long. And uh, fortunately, it paid off for him. I knew he was on me, but, you know, I, just, I was just concentrating on the ball and... He just fell in my hand and just had to hold on to it and come down with it. Things went from bad to worse for the Rams. Special teams as they've all got two safeties off a high snap and a blocked punt to finish the scoring in a 49-3 run. Next up is Mississippi State and the start of the SEC schedule. We're going to have to play uh, no offense. We'll probably have to play a little better, execute a little better than we did tonight. Uh, you know, I, I have all the confidence in the world that our defense will play well, but you know, we've got to work cut out for us next week. So there's no chance of a little overconfidence going in? Oh, I don't think so. Uh, you know, this is the SEC schedule, and uh, this is what we play, you know, the other two games for to get to the SEC schedule. So, uh, you know, we're excited about it, and we've got to work cut out for us. And I think us as players learned a lesson from last year, you know, after the 85 SEC championship. It's not, you know, you can't go out because everybody's going to be shooting for Tennessee, so we just got to play as hard as we can every game. Oh, uh, it's always good to win, and, uh, you know, the big, big concern this week was bouncing back after playing on uh, a game like Sunday's game and having a little less time to prepare for the ball game with, uh, with Colorado State, uh, getting a few of your people mended, uh, 
and heal from some bruises, which we had in the first ball game. The, the next ball game is going to be entirely different. I think that Mississippi State probably will be the toughest team that we've played, both, uh, including Iowa. And they'll be big and strong, and Ben Stark will we'll have to play better than we played all year, in my opinion, to win that ball game. I see 2-0 and on the young season, annihilating Colorado State 49-3, and of course, it's easy to see why Alvin Harper and Sterling Hinton say that's a moment they'll never forget that connection. Do you remember the first time you stepped on the field as a freshman? Oh, I sure do. We were playing University of Pittsburgh in the opening game, and of course, it didn't turn out as well for us because we got beat 13-3 that night, but it was exciting for us also to be able to step out there in front of 95,000 people, and I remember my eyes were as big as saucers going out mm -hmm. to that ball game. Well, it was a great win for the Tennessee Vols in their home opener. 49-3, to they drill Colorado State. As Coach Major says, the road does not get any easier. Mississippi State's ahead. They won last night. Highlights and other scores from the SEC is coming up. Balls already 2-0 and on the young season, but for the rest of the Southeastern Conference, except Kentucky and Vanderbilt, yesterday was opening day. A lot of exciting Southeastern good, and of course, Tennessee will be taking on Mississippi State, a big rematch from last year. Tennessee's going to be looking for some revenge. Mississippi State responsible for the downfall of the Balls early on the last season. Another special feature of Big Orange Sunday is John Ward's journal. That's coming up. Celebrate victory at the Volador in the Hyatt Regency. Open Tuesday through Saturday and serving delectable entrees. Price $15. Sunday, as well as adding his expertise in the play-by-play -play booth, John Ward will also be adding a special feature called John Ward's Vol Journal. Now, this week, he'll be taking a look at the historical background at Neyland Stadium with light right here at Neyland. Tennessee's victory over Colorado State last night at Neyland Stadium marked the 25th time the Volunteers have played a night game here at Neyland Stadium since lights were installed in 1972. Tennessee's record is now 15, 8, and 2 in what fans call Neyland at night. How were lights installed? How did it all come about? Well, that story underscores the intelligence, the foresight, and the negotiating ability of former University of Tennessee Athletic Director Bob Woodruff, as UT President Ed Bowling recalls. He got on the telephone call on a telephone call with the with the uh, athletic director at Penn State. And this was the famous night when we were, had been trying to decide whether or not they would come back and play that game that they owed us. They didn't want to come because it was too hot to play in early September. Uh, and so they finally made the statement to Bob that uh, they would only come if, if we had lights. Well, in his dragging way, he would slowly say this and he would say that and I don't think uh, the athletic director ever knew exactly what he was getting into but Bob finally turned to me put his hand over the telephone and he said with what we're going to get out of this I could buy the lights and I, he said uh, should I tell him we'll have lights I said tell him we'll have lights so, so that's how Tennessee elected and decided to install lights the volunteers won that game over Penn State by a score of 28 to 21 the first of 25 night games played at Neyland Stadium. Memorable moments? Yes, of course. Coach Johnny Major's first game was a night game in 1977. Tennessee lost, but the very next week, Tennessee came back to win the second night game in 77 over Boston College. And who will ever forget the first two games in the expanded Neyland Stadium in 1980? The first game, Tennessee and Georgia. The Volunteers led for much of the game. Georgia came from behind to win 16 to 15, introducing a new running back. His name, Herschel Walker. Georgia went on, of course, later to win a national championship. The next game in 1980, Tennessee played Southern California. The Vols got ahead, then came from behind to tie the score at 17-17. But then, turnover, Southern Cal got the ball, marched downfield and kicked a long, long field goal in the waning seconds to win the game 20-17. to Then Tennessee played in 1985, a mid-season night game, unusual. It was against Georgia Tech the week before Tennessee had beaten Alabama in Birmingham. But in that game, Tony Robinson went out with an injury that concluded his career at the University of Tennessee. Daryl Dickey, Dickey substituted for yeah, Robinson and played the, the rest of the Alabama That's game and started against Georgia Tech. Tough going for the Volunteers offensively, but in the final minute, 
Tennessee marched to get within field goal range. Ravage hit the field goal, tying the score 6-6. Six -six. Tennessee went from that night game on to win the rest of the game, the Southeastern Conference Championship, and of course, win over Miami in the Sugar Bowl. So, the night at Neyland, a big part of Tennessee football tradition. One thing I could say, in visiting around the country, there's no place as beautiful as Neyland Stadium, particularly at night. An emerald field makes Neyland at night something very, very special. This is John Ward. Thanks, John, and I think he hit it right on the head when he said there's no place not clean in Atlanta. It was great here last night. Absolutely the atmosphere beautiful. and everything else. It certainly was. And a big win, too. But big that win. always helps. 49 <laughs> to 3. The University of Tennessee volunteers over Colorado State. Some closing notes in a moment. Big win for the balls yesterday. A big confidence builder. Now, what kind of things is Johnny Majors going to say to his players when he gets on the practice field on Monday? What kind of things, even after a 49 to 3 win, can they get out there and improve on? Well, he's going to tell them that yes, we've had two good, two excellent football games. We beat an excellent Iowa team. We beat an average Colorado State team, but we looked pretty good in the second half in doing it. I think he's going to tell them we have to keep the intensity up. The defense has to continue to play as well as they're playing, continue to force turnovers, show a lot of enthusiasm. And offense has to get a quicker start out of the, out of the gate, out of the shoot, come now against Mississippi State. Now we're into the part of the schedule that everyone's been waiting for, the SEC race, and this is what everyone's looking forward to. That's exactly what I was thinking. You hit the nail on the head. The win over Iowa, the win over Colorado State, both big, but in the long run, they count very little. They pale, as it were, in comparison to the importance of the Mississippi State game. Beating Mississippi State is not an easy thing to do, especially at Starkville, and it is a key Southeastern Conference game early in the season. Yes, we were talking earlier about Mississippi State and how much trouble they give Tennessee and has given Coach Majors and his teams trouble through the years, and I believe that they haven't beaten them since 79 or they... Since 79, since they've been playing, they have not beaten Mississippi State. And playing them at Starkville, even though Don Smith's gone, is no easy task. And it's going to be hot down there, and the players need to be ready for it. Like you said, Don Smith is gone. He was a major key in that win last year. And I'm sure Tennessee is thinking, as they go down to Starkville, revenge. Because last year, like we said before, that was the game that really started the balls on the downward trend at the beginning of that season. Uh, a number of losses to begin the season with. And Don Smith is gone, but Jeff Francis uh, dislocated his shoulder, separated his shoulder in that game as well. So he's going to be looking to get a little revenge as well. Yes, of course Jeff's going to try and stay healthy all year. And he had a little ankle trouble earlier, but he hasn't missed any game action. As long as you can keep your starting quarterback healthy, as long as things go well for the team like that, and maybe Jeff can get a little revenge down in Starkville. Let me ask you something, Charles. Having played here at Tennessee, is it easier to get up for a Southeastern Conference game than it is to get up for an Iowa or a Colorado State? And those kind of thoughts that are going through the team mind this week. Well, it really should be easier to get up for an SEC opponent, but at times it can be tough because of the way your schedule falls. This year, getting up for Iowa was very easy. It was a kickoff classic. It was a spotlight game of the whole nation. And then also getting up for Colorado State is the opening game at home at night. It's a great atmosphere. It shouldn't be too hard to get up for Mississippi State, but it's funny. We're 18 to 22 years old playing, and our minds are different. Our minds are a little, you know, a little bit different right now. We just don't know how we're going to react when we hit the field each week. We're not so tough as to get things done as easily as people think we can. So the season of irony continues for the Tennessee Volunteers. The defense coming to the forefront, the offense playing a little second fiddle. We'll see how things work out next week against Mississippi State in Starkville. For now, I'm Greg Peterson for Daryl Patterson and Charles Davis. See you later, everybody. Everything else is just a light. By the Big Orange Ford dealers of Tennessee, where you can get 1.9% financing for new cars and trucks. By St. Mary's Medical Center in Knoxville, 
appearing to you anytime with Total Health Care. By the natural gas utilities and pipeline companies throughout Tennessee. And by First American, where banking is still a people business.